Hey, church, let me invite you to grab your copy of God's word and meet me in the book of Colossians chapter one. Uh, We are going to turn our attention to verses 24 uh, down to verse 29 today. Colossians 1, 24 to 29. We are continuing our sermon series through the book of Colossians verse by verse and chapter by chapter called Rooted. And today we come to the very end of Colossians chapter one and you say, Jesse, it's about time We've been in chapter one for a while, but there's so much beauty, so much goodness in chapter one that we've needed to look at. But today we are rounding out our time in Colossians chapter one, verses 24 down to 29. You know, I distinctly remember early on in my Christian life uh, where I discovered a, a genre of reading that I've never gotten past. I've always been a reader, and in particular, I've always loved reading biography. I still read a ton of biography uh, to this day. But I'll never forget, as an early, younger Christian, uh, discovering this genre called missionary biography. All of these biographical accounts of missionaries who risked everything to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. They risk their very lives so that more people can hear about Jesus Christ. And I just started to devour these biographies and these stories about these different missionaries. So whether it was Adniram Judson in Burma or William Carey in India or Jim Elliott in Ecuador or Helen Rosevere in the Congo. I just read and devoured and enjoyed learning about these different missionaries. In fact, just last night uh, with our daughters, we read uh, sort of a kid-friendly biography of, of Helen Rosevere and her ministry in the Congo. I, I, I was drawn into sort of these exciting stories, these men and women who went to the edge of civilization uh, with, with, with their boldness, and that's about all they had. And they went there because they wanted more people to hear about Jesus Christ. I've always been sort of drawn to that boldness of faith uh, that we see in these, these missionaries. In fact, I remember in college, uh, I would be sitting in my, my college baseball study hall uh, period in our, in our athletics facility, and I just had mounds of homework next to me that I should have been doing. And yet here I was just reading about these different missionaries uh, throughout church history. Uh, but as I was reading about them, something very interesting kind of stood out to me, that actually these men and women, that there weren't too many commonalities among them, other than they loved Jesus and and, and they wanted more people to hear about him, that's kind of where the commonality stopped with all of these different missionaries. Uh, Because these missionaries, some were men and some were women. Uh, Some were older and some were younger. Uh, Some were were incredibly uh, educated at high level institutions and, and others had a second or a third grade education. Some of these missionaries had families and large numbers of children, and and others were single. There there weren't too many commonalities among these different missionaries, but there was actually one common thread that stood out. It, It wasn't their stage of life. It wasn't their background. No, it was something that each one of them experienced. And the common thread that stood out in each of these stories about missionaries that I was reading is this, that each one of them suffered greatly for the name of Jesus Christ. Each one of them knew what it meant to suffer. And in fact, it was through their sufferings that the Lord Jesus was proclaimed. So suffering wasn't something that was on the side of their lives, but it was actually the very means and the very channel through which the name of Jesus Christ was known. It was through their sufferings. And and, and as I was studying this passage this past week, I could not help but think of those faithful missionaries who suffered. Because in our text this morning, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul himself suffered, and that in fact all Christians are invited into this life of suffering so that the gospel of Jesus Christ can go out. If I could summarize our message this morning, I would put it this way, that you and I as believers in Christ, that we are called to be servants who suffer and strive so that more people mature in Jesus Christ. 
Let me say that again, that we are called to be servants who suffer and strive to see more people mature in Christ. That's how Paul is describing himself, and that's how he's describing all Christians as men and women, students and children called into this life of glorious suffering so that Jesus Christ, so that that name that we just sang about, that that name goes out. Our passage this morning is is really a mini biography. It's the Apostle Paul explaining to us who he is and what he's all about. Uh, We've talked about this throughout this series that uh, this is a letter written to a, a, a small church in the city of Colossae. And the Apostle Paul himself did not plant this church. And so here in verses 24 down to 29, he, he gives them a mini biography so that they know who he is. And, and really what these verses are, they're a fantastic glimpse at what faithful ministry is all about what a biblical, faithful ministry looks like. That's what he's describing here in these verses. In fact, this is a great passage to to hand to a young pastor, to a young preacher, so that he knows what God has called him to do. In fact, if, if I ever preach like a seminary graduation for young pastors, this would be a fantastic passage to, to preach from. This is a great passage to hand to a missionary so that they know what it is that God is calling them to do. Now, this morning, I know that I'm not talking to a room full of pastors, but I am talking to a room full of missionaries. Missionaries, perhaps, that God will call overseas, but all of you missionaries that God has called to a specific place, wherever it is that he's planted you. So I want to tailor this passage so so that it helps you in your daily life. Uh, as you you go about uh, your daily life as a believer in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to 29. Church, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet if you're able. I'm going to read this out loud over us this morning. When I'm done reading, I'm going to affirm that we believe this is God's word through which he speaks to his people. And if you're thankful for that, when I'm finished reading, you can respond, thanks be to God. Listen to Colossians 1, beginning in verse 24. Paul writes this, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Church, go ahead and have a seat. Rejoicing in our suffering, we are called to be servants who suffer and strive to see more people mature in Jesus Christ. And right away, right off the bat in verse 24, we see this concept of rejoicing in suffering, which seems and sounds like an oxymoron. Rejoicing and suffering, those don't go together. But we see actually right away in verse 24 that the Apostle Paul brings these things together. Notice how he begins. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Now, what are the sufferings that the Apostle Paul is rejoicing in? Well, you'll remember that the Apostle Paul is penning this letter from prison. And so he's in chains. That's, that's, the, that's the, the, the suffering that he's experiencing, the chains that are binding him right now because of his faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And now we know that the Apostle Paul faced all sorts of suffering over the course of his life. He, he faced sufferings in regards to his health. He faced relational sufferings where people turned their backs on him. Uh, He faced physical suffering where where he would go days and weeks and perhaps even months not knowing where his next meal would come from. 
And certainly he faced suffering because of his faithfulness to, to Jesus. Uh, he received persecution. And, and here, as he's writing these words, he's in prison. He's been locked up because he keeps talking about Jesus. And what does Paul say about these sufferings? Well, verse 24, he says that he rejoices in them. Now, I don't want to move too quickly past that. That is striking. And in fact, that is shocking that the Apostle Paul would say he's rejoicing in his suffering, right? You and I in, in 2024 America and in the West, we try to do everything that we can to escape suffering, don't we? We'll spend all sorts of money on things to remove suffering from our lives. And yet Paul here says that he's not trying to flee it. He's actually rejoicing in it. It's a striking thought, but that's what Paul says Christians are called to do, to rejoice in our sufferings. And it's not just that when Paul wrote these words, he woke up on the right side of the bed that day. It, it's not just that he was having a good day on this particular day. No, this is what Paul says over and over and over and over again in the New Testament. We we read Romans 5.3, where Paul says effectively the same thing. We rejoice in our suffering. We rejoice in those trials and tribulations and difficulties and sufferings that we face in our lives. Now, when the apostle Paul says that he rejoices in his suffering, we, we can't take Paul to be like this detached psychopath. Who's, who's just like hungry to suffer and hungry to walk through hard things. That, that's not what Paul is describing here. Paul is not saying that suffering is by nature good. Paul is not saying that suffering by nature is enjoyable. But here's what Paul is saying, and this will become clear as the text unfolds. He is saying this, that Paul knew through his sufferings, notice, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. He's talking about the church. In his sufferings for the church, Paul knows that Christ was being proclaimed through the very sufferings that Paul was experiencing. And here's what we know about Paul, that he cared more about the name of Jesus Christ being proclaimed than he cared about his own personal comforts. Jesus, Paul cared more about Jesus being made known than Paul having a cushy life. Everyone around Paul kind of wanted this nerfy, safe life. And for so many people, like that is the standard of success. Is my life comfortable? And Paul says, no, I have something much higher in mind when I define success for my life. It's that Jesus Christ is made known. And if that requires that I go through suffering, then so be it. Because what's ultimate is Christ being proclaimed, not me being comfortable. So what Paul does here is he reframes suffering. He, he, he turns suffering upside down for us. And he says, actually, suffering can be something we rejoice in because through suffering, more people see and hear about Jesus Christ. Now, it's not natural for us. This is not normal for us, but, but this is how Paul describes the Christian life. I wonder, I wonder if in your seasons of suffering, you've ever felt like Winston Churchill did. Winston Churchill once uh, experienced a devastating election loss. He, he, he expected to win this election, and when he didn't win it, it was incredibly embarrassing and difficult for him to like even show his face out in public. And as he was uh, sort of just kind of uh, dealing with this, this embarrassment from this election loss, his, his sweet wife, Clementine, uh, she, she nuzzled up next to him, and she tried to cheer him up. Uh, she tried to put a smile on his face, and, and she very gently and lovingly said to him, you know, Winston, uh, this loss is, is probably a blessing in disguise. And, and, and Churchill kind of mumbled uh, this response back to her. He, he said, well, at the moment, it seems very effectively disguised. 
that's normally how we think about suffering. It might feel or we might hear that it's a blessing in disguise, but it certainly doesn't look like it. And it's, it's very difficult to see how God is working. It's very difficult to, to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's very difficult to see how God's going to, to pull all things together. And yet, even then, you and I can still rejoice because if Jesus is proclaimed in and through our sufferings, that's more important than us feeling comfortable. Because ultimately, what we're after in this life is Jesus's name getting out. And if that requires my suffering, then sign me up. Because what's most important is the name of Jesus. So he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. And then he moves into the second half of verse 24, which has been called, by the way, one of the most debated verses in all of Scripture. Colossians 1, 24, which is exactly what you want to read and see as you're preparing a sermon on this particular verse, right? This is a very challenging verse to understand, the second half of verse 24. And so we're going to do our best to understand what Paul is saying here. Notice what Paul says. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. Now, what is Paul getting at when he says that I'm completing in my flesh, his flesh, what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body? What is, what is Paul driving at here? I mean, that, that sounds borderline heretical, doesn't it? It sounds almost if Paul is saying that there is some insufficiency in what Jesus accomplished on the cross, so Paul has to step in and fill out what Jesus failed to accomplish. That, 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 that is kind of what, what it seems like Paul might be saying at first glance. So what is Paul driving at? What can this mean? Well, we know what this can't mean mean. We know what this does not mean because of what Paul says at other places in the New Testament. And so we know that what Paul is saying here is not that he believes Jesus didn't accomplish everything, so he has to step in and kind of finish the job for Jesus. That's not what Paul is saying at all, because elsewhere in Romans chapter 6, Paul says this, the death Jesus died he died to sin once and for all. Amen. So we know that Paul's not saying oh, Jesus didn't finish the job because he says Jesus has died once and for all. Uh, by the way, Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that uh, upon his, his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, Jesus, the son of God, he sat down at the right hand of the father, which means the job was finished. And, and so when Jesus says from the cross, it is finished, Jesus meant that. And so Paul is not saying that, that Jesus didn't fulfill the mission that he was called to. That, that's not at all what he's saying. So then, what is lacking? What is Paul saying he had to do? What, what is it that he had to finish? Well, there are a few different faithful ways to kind of understand what Paul is getting at. Let me give you my best take on what Paul is driving at here. Uh, in short, uh, what Paul is saying is while the payment for sin is complete, the, the message of the gospel, the message of what Jesus has done, that still must be taken out and delivered so that real people can really hear what Jesus has really done and so that they can turn from sin and trust in Christ to really be saved. In other words, Paul's job is not to finish up what Jesus left undone, but Paul's job is to take that message out so that other people can hear it and other people can be saved and changed by Jesus Christ. So in that sense, there's still work to be done. There's still work to do to take what Christ has accomplished and to get that message out to other people. 
It would be like this, and I know this is an imperfect illustration, but it's kind of the best I could come up with. Uh, it would be like this. If I bought a gift for my wife, Marissa, and the, the, the gift is purchased, the transaction is complete, uh, but I haven't yet delivered it to her. That, that's almost what Paul is describing, right? That gift is as good as hers because I've purchased it, and, 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 and I have every intention of delivering it to her, but there's still a delivery to happen, and there's still a receiving that has to happen in order to complete the process. Paul is saying that's what's lacking, the delivery of the message and the receiving of that message, and that's what Paul is fulfilling. He's fulfilling that call to take the gospel out. Christ commissioned Paul to deliver what is already sufficient, which is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, He's been commissioned to take that message out to others. The great American Baptist theologian, who, the, the guy that I wrote my PhD dissertation on, uh, Carl F.H. Henry, uh, he is reported to have put it this way. He said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there on time. The gospel is only good news if it gets there on time. And, and, and so the mission is still wanting because there's still billions of people in our world who have not heard of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is saying he stepped into. And by the way, that's what the Bible says all Christians step into to fulfill this delivery of the message to the ends of the earth. And here's the striking thing. Here's how the first half of verse 24 and the second half of verse 24 relate. Paul says that the gospel advances through the suffering of God's people. That, that, that of all the different ways God could use and God could intend to get the gospel out, it seems that he often uses suffering as the channel through which more people hear the gospel. And we may say, God, I would love for there to be another route here. And yet over and over and over again in the Bible, it's suffering that God uses to display the beauty and the power of Jesus Christ. In fact, we see this uh, in the book of Acts itself. The, the whole book of Acts is structured around this very truth that God uses suffering to push the gospel out further. Here's what I mean. Uh, in Acts chapter one, you'll remember that, that the disciples are there in Jerusalem. Jesus tells them, you will receive power uh, in the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses uh, here in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. Now, where are they when Jesus tells them that? Well, they're in Jerusalem and, and they would like to stay in Jerusalem. But Jesus says, I'm going to push you further and further out. But just in their nature, they want to stay there. And so what does God use to push them beyond their comfort zone? Well, he uses suffering. And there's this wave of persecution. There's this wave of suffering that takes the early Christians from Jerusalem out to Judea and Samaria. And then what do you know? There's another wave of suffering and persecution to take them from Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. God has always used suffering to advance the gospel. One pastor put it this way, and I thought this was so helpful to, to kind of get at what Paul is saying here. He said this, the cross that Jesus bore was for propitiation. That's just a fancy word that means the wrath of God being satisfied in Jesus so that you and I don't have to bear it. So the cross Jesus bore was for propitiation, and the ones that we bear are for propagation. The crosses that you and I bear, the struggles and the sufferings we face, that's so that the gospel can be made known and seen through your very life. So that means if Jesus is known in my loss, if Jesus is known in my heartache, if Jesus is made known through my suffering, if Jesus is made known through my situation, if Jesus is made known through my cancer diagnosis, if Jesus is made known through this dark trial in my life, Paul says, we can rejoice in that. The sufferings Paul's talking about here are specifically the sufferings that Christians will face for being faithful to Jesus Christ. And Jesus in Matthew chapter five, he, he says, if you are ridiculed and treated shamefully on behalf of my name, then rejoice. Rejoice. 
This is what Jesus tells us in Matthew 5. Again, why can I do that? Why do we do that? Well, it's because we care more about Jesus being made known than our personal comforts. And if Jesus can peer through those moments of suffering in my life and in your life so that other people see Jesus has been faithful to this person. Jesus continues to walk with this person. This person continues to worship this Jesus. As people see that and sense that, then they'll begin to wonder, maybe there's something to this Jesus stuff after all. And so how does Jesus want to use your sufferings to make himself known? And by the way, how can Paul even say this sort of thing? Because this is a wild thing to say that I rejoice in my sufferings. It's not natural. This is supernatural. This is otherworldly. But I think we see why Paul can say this in verse 25. Look how Paul describes himself. He says, I have become its servant. It's there refers to the church right before. I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now, some translations will, will render the word servant here as minister. And that, that's an okay translation, but the way that we think about minister and servant, uh, the, the, the best way to understand this particular word is using the word servant. Uh, this is actually the same word that Jesus uses of himself in Mark chapter 10, where Jesus says, the son of man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus himself uses the term servant. That's the same word Paul uses here. Paul says that he is a servant of the church. So the reason Paul could rejoice in his sufferings is because he exists to serve the church, to bless the church, not to serve or bless himself. And if these sufferings were ways for the church to be strengthened and other people to hear the gospel, then that was worth celebrating. Because Paul is a servant. And notice, again, this is so important. Notice he says that he is a servant of the church, which means that Paul did not see himself as a critic of the church or a constant evaluator of the church or a thorn in the church's side or a judge over the church, as somebody who existed over the church to, to point out what was wrong and lacking. Paul, Paul doesn't see himself in that role. No, he says, I'm a servant. Now, I, I, I come underneath the church, come alongside the church to love the church and care for the church and serve the church. That's why he could rejoice in sufferings, because his life existed to serve others. And even today, God continues to expect his people to be servants, even here at West Conroe. And so if Jesus himself called himself a servant, if the apostle Paul called himself a servant, then then you and I should also see ourselves as servants, servants of the church, of real people, so that they're strengthened and built up in Christ. And so maybe today is as you're reading these words from the Apostle Paul, maybe today you want to make a kingdom investment that will far outlast your life. And and I pray you do want to make that sort of difference. That's the sort of difference I want to make with my few years that the Lord graciously gives me here. I want those years to be leveraged for the gospel in such a way that it will ripple beyond my own life. That's my hope. And, And that might be your hope. And you know a great way to do that? to make a kingdom investment that will far outlast you. I mean this with no humor. A great way to do that is to rock and to sing to and to pray for babies in our nursery here at West Conroe Baptist Church. That's a way you can make a generational impact. Or or maybe it's signing up to volunteer in our children's ministry on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights. Or, Or with our students on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights. Maybe that's the way that God is calling you to serve, just like he called Paul to serve. Or or maybe some of you know that walking into a church building for the very first time where you know nobody, maybe some of you know from firsthand experience, that's an incredibly difficult thing to do and a very intimidating thing to do. And maybe 
One way you can serve is by offering a friendly face to somebody when they walk in so that you can welcome them and greet them and orient them to the building. Maybe that's how God is calling you to serve. Maybe you feel burdened to serve families in our Discovery Special Needs Ministry. I can go on and on, but, but I do know that the Lord calls all of us to be servants. And real quick, let me just pastorally say, thank you to all of you who serve in any number of different ways so that we can do what we do here at West Conroe. You are making a difference. You might not always see that. You might not always hear about the difference that you're making, but I'm telling you pastorally that you are making a difference. Just like there are no small churches in the kingdom of God, there are no small volunteer roles in the church. You are making a difference. And so Thank you for doing that. And this morning, as we're talking about servanthood, this might be a gentle push to you to say, you know what, I, I need to jump into an area of service. And if that's you, we want to we talk with you and equip you and train you and mobilize you and launch you out into a place of service. Contact our office, step by our next, stop by our next steps area. We would love to talk to you about what it means to serve. Paul knew that his service was to the church, and that service would often come through suffering. And as we come to the end of the passage, I want you to notice how Paul describes the gospel. Verse 26, he describes the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul knew that his suffering would serve the gospel. How does he describe the gospel? Well, he describes it as a mystery in verses 26 and 27. So what is this mystery that he's referring to? Why does he use the term mystery? Well, when Paul uses the term mystery, he's referring to this, the overarching storyline of the Bible, which is this, that God in his grace made mankind, but mankind we we sinned. Started with Adam and Eve, you and I have continued the family tradition. And that, that sin has ruptured this relationship that we had with God. And we cannot repair that on our own. We needed God to come in to rescue us and to reconcile us back to himself. And the way that God does that is by sending his perfect son, Jesus, to die in our place on the cross and then to rise again on the third day. And if someone will turn from their sin and turn to Jesus, you'll be cleansed of that sin and you'll be brought back into a right relationship with, with God who, who loves you. This is what we call the gospel, the good news. Maybe you're hearing this for the first time today. I, the end of the service. I'll be down front. We'd love to talk to you or reach out to our office. We'd love to visit with you about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And he, and he says, uh, he, the way he describes this is, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When God created this new people of Jews and, and Gentiles, he creates one new people. And, and what that means is that anyone can get in on this. You can get in on this. This is open to you today. And it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you want to know what hope truly is, well, that only comes through Jesus Christ. And so Paul was willing to suffer so that that message, the gospel, could get out to more and more people. And he tells us in verse 29, his whole life is devoted to this. He says, I labor for this. I strive with his strength that he powerfully works within me. Why? So that he can present everyone mature in Christ. So in other words, what Paul's saying is that Christianity for him was not a hobby. And Christianity is a really lame hobby. Christianity is called to be everything. Jesus himself is called to be everything. We're called to strive and labor with everything that we have so that more people can hear the gospel. That starts in your home. That starts in your neighborhood. That, that, that starts at your workplace. That pushes out to the ends of the earth. What are you striving for today? What gets your attention and your energy? Where are you putting your resources? Where are you putting your, your mind day in and day out? Paul, Paul tells us that we should be laboring and striving in the gospel for 
the gospel. We are called to be servants who suffer and strive to see more people mature in Jesus Christ. I mentioned a missionary at the very beginning of the sermon named Helen Rosevear. Uh, and I mentioned last night, we read a little biography about her with, with my daughters. And uh, as we close, I want you to listen very closely to how Helen Rosevear described her own missionary life. If you don't know anything about her life, she was a doctor. And she was a missionary to the Congo. And when she arrived in the Congo not long after, Helen Rosevere experienced horrific, really unimaginable treatment at the very hands of those that she loved and came to share the gospel with. We, we, we can't put into to words the sort of abuse that she encountered for her faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And later on in life, Helen Rosevere recounted her experience as a missionary in the Congo. And I want you to listen to how she described her missionary experience. She said this, quote, one word became unbelievably clear, and that word was privilege. God didn't take away the pain or the cruelty or the humiliation. No, it was all there. But now it was altogether different. It was with him and for him and in him. He was actually offering me the inestimable privilege of sharing in some little way the edge of the fellowship of his suffering. In the weeks of imprisonment that followed and in the subsequent years of continued service, looking back, I have tried to count the cost, but I find it all swallowed up in privilege. The cost suddenly seems very small and transient in the greatness and permanence of the privilege. What suffering are you facing this moment? that the Lord Jesus wants to leverage for the kingdom so that now we can look at that suffering not as suffering, but as a privilege. Because through this suffering, people will see and hear about Jesus Christ. From the very first century all the way up to the most recent one, we see Acts chapter 5, verse 41 played out in the lives of Christians, where Christians have been rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name of Jesus Christ. And so Christians can make the wild remark, but the true remark, that indeed we do rejoice in our sufferings because it's the means through which Jesus Christ is made known. And that privilege is far more precious than anything that this fleeting world can offer.